Now, TVS certificate is also a built-in service. It's by default self-signed, and it's the in the back end, it's uh, responsible for security by default, and it is available from CUCM version 8.0 and later. And as, again, uh, security by default does not need any physical tokens. It uses e-tokens built into the call manager, whereas the CAPF function requires physical e-tokens. You must have had a situation when you need to secure a CUCM cluster, but then you require an e-token for the same. The phone VPN certificate is leveraged by the endpoints, which have a built-in phone VPN client, like the 79XX series, the 89XX, and 99XX. So depending upon the type of endpoint, you can browse to settings, security, and from there initiate a VPN connection, which is built into the firmware, the VPN, any connect VPN client. And what call manager needs to do at that point in time is it looks upon ASA as a proxy to the phone. So the phone communicates using any connect to the ASA, and ASA then decrypts the session, sends it to CUCM, that is the signaling, and media directly to the endpoint on the, within the enterprise premises. So at that point in time, the VPN certificate is something which you'll see when you would have imported the ASA self-signed or ASA third-party signed certificate into CUCM. With that, we come to the last part or the last section of the presentation, that is managing CUCM certificate. There are various tools which are available which you can leverage to manage certificates and ensure that there is a process to manage the PKI framework within your enterprise. The first obvious tool which comes to mind is the certificate expiry monitor, which is available on CUCM OS administration page. So you can set an email notification, and whenever a certificate would be about to expire, that is a few days before its expiry, it will send out a notification to whatever email address was punched in, such that you are aware that, hey, this certificate is going to expire. So ideally, what should be done is that enterprise-wide PKI, or a server being used to sign all the certificates, then you know what date it, the certificates were signed and then accordingly you can track all across the enterprise that, hey, on this day our certificates are going to expire and we should go ahead and renew them well before the time. Because the moment a certificate expires, that service will be impacted. The users will start getting errors or the users will simply not be able to access the service. So it's, it's, a, it's a strong recommendation to keep an eye on certificate expiry and regenerate the certificate or have a new signed certificate in place before the actual certificate expires for that service. What we also have is the online certificate status protocol, OSCP, for certificate revocation, because some form of certificate revocation is necessary. How would I know if a certificate, certificate is no longer valid or it was revoked because the keys were compromised? So there is that mechanism of OSCP, which allows live certificate revocation possibility on CUCM. It requires a third-party software to intervene between the actual CA and CUCM, so it sits in between and proxies the request. When the CUCM sends a request using the certificate serial number, that is this certificate valid, the OSCP software in between, the, the proxy in between, will send that request to CA, and the CA will say, yes, this certificate is valid, or no, this certificate has been revoked, or no, this certificate is no longer valid. Three types of responses back to the proxy, which is, again, related to the CCM. So essentially, this is another management tool which you can leverage to your advantage. Then uh, there is a common issue. Uh, people ask the question, when I upgrade to the newer CCM version, what will happen to my certificates? Do I need to regenerate them? Do I need to worry about my CTL file? What happens to my CAPES certificate? What happens to my secure endpoints? So as a fact, when you upgrade, a CUCM to the same version and restore a DRS backup. Ideally, all the certificates, their keys, are also exported in the DRS backup and restored. However, there are some known defects, some bugs, which can impact. So it's uh, in case you see that a certificate-based service, such as an IPsec certificate, when you're trying to do a DRS backup, for example, and it is no longer working because it says DRF master is down or something like that, it's an identification, uh, it's, it's, it's a notification that something went wrong with the certificate and uh, the cluster members are not able to properly communicate amongst themselves for certain services. At that point in time, it is viable to go ahead and regenerate the IPsec certificate. Also, in case of CTL, if you have a secure cluster and you're using secure endpoints, 
when you migrate to newer hardware or upgrade to the next version, it is recommended to download the latest CTL client available in the latest version you have upgraded to and rerun the CTL client during a maintenance window just to ensure that your CTL file is up to date even if you have not changed any host names or so, but still to ensure that the CTL file is up to date and there is no discrepancy while upgrading from one version to another. Again, the rollback parameter which is available in enterprise parameters of CUCM is really useful when you are upgrading from a pre-8.x to 8.x or 9.x, say, during drive to 9. So you have the chance to roll back to the previous version in case ITL does not work for you. That is, the security by default really doesn't work for you. There are other tools as well, such as phone view, which can help you troubleshoot the ITL issues. So what happens when you lose your e-tokens? Say you have a secure cluster and you lose your e-tokens, what happens then? Really, you're stuck because e-tokens, once you set your cluster mode to secure, to set it back to insecure or when you want to add another member to the cluster or delete a member from the cluster, you do need e-tokens again while running the CTL client. And only the e-tokens which were originally used, their keys will be used by the CTL client to sign the certificates. So if you lose your e-tokens, there is no easy way out. That is why the strong recommendation is to have more than a couple of e-tokens. Cisco recommends at least two e-tokens, which are required. Again, they are for redundancy. But what could be done is multiple e-tokens, say four e-tokens kept in pairs at two different locations, just in case you lose even one pair, you have another one to still manipulate your cluster. Um, moreover, if you are stuck with losing e-tokens and you cannot turn back your cluster to unsecured mode or add another member to the cluster, the only other way out is to export the data using BAT, build a new cluster, import the data, and encrypt the new cluster again with a new set of e-tokens. That is something which is a way out, not so easy, not so pretty, but yes, it's at least a way out of a cluster which you cannot even work with. So you can manipulate certificate information. For example, if I want to generate a Tomcat request, but I am not sure that my common name was right, set up right during the installation or there are other parameters which I need to set, what we can do is we can go to the OS CLI and issue the command show web security. It pretty much illustrates all the information associated with the certificate. And then to set a certain parameter within that certificate, which was used during the installation, the command set web security can be used, which will allow you to set a specific parameter. You can specify, say, for example, you want to change the state to something else. So say state and then the name. And ensure that once this is done, again, restart the Tomcat service on uh, using util service restart Cisco Tomcat. Otherwise, this change will not uh, be implied on, on Cisco Tomcat since it will be picking it up from cache. Now, there are certificate management tools. There are tools uh, that is such as the Windows Certificate Viewer. So you double click a certificate, it opens up, it shows all the information right then and there. So you can compare different certificate, look at the issuer, look at the keys and so on. Not really the keys, but then the fingerprints. So it is a a pretty handy tool and it is available to all the PC users. Uh, for Mac users, there is another tool. And also for, P for PC users, there is a more detailed tool better known as OpenSSL. Now this tool, although it is available on Mac, Linux, and on Windows, it is a command line driven tool. So it's not a GUI based tool, so that's the only inconvenience with it. However, this tool has the ability what Windows Viewer does not, that is, it can even show the contents of a certificate signing request, which the Windows Certificate Viewer cannot really. So Windows Certificate Viewer can show you the contents of a certificate file, a .cer, .pen, .der, but .csr it cannot open. You eventually have to open it up with a notepad, and you really cannot understand the contents, whereas with OpenSSL, you can do that. Now, there is, there is a command syntax such as OpenSSL, the command and options. Now, there are different options which can be RSA to work with RSA keys, X509 to work with certificates, or REQ to work with the CSR. With that, we come to the end of the presentation.